This is going to be the overview for Second Peter. It's a really short epistle. It's got three chapters, 61 verses. The author is Peter, obviously. And the theme is growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the historical application is this is Peter's letter to saints who are under attack by false teachers. The doctrinal application is that this is a letter to tribulation saints to encourage them while they're under attack of the harlots teachers, the great whore, mystery Babylon, that mystery satanic religion. And inspirationally, what you have is God's word is efficient to equip the saint for battle against these false teachers. Chapter 1. In chapter 1, you're going to see we have a more sure word of prophecy spoken by men who were moved by the Holy Ghost. Second uh, Peter 1, 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You see, the more knowledge you get about God, the more you're going to grow in grace. The more you learn about God, the more peace of God you're going to have. He said in verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. And he keeps going with that. Add this and add that. You see, the greatest Christian on the planet still has things that he needs to add to his faith. How else can he grow if he doesn't add some stuff? Uh, first, Peter said, he said, grace and peace be multiplied. Now he wants you to add something. And if you want to add to your faith, then you got to subtract wicked things from your life and get more knowledge of God by rightly dividing the word of truth. And there's your math lesson for the day. Think about that. Add some things to your faith. Subtract wicked, th wicked things from your life. Divide the word of truth. Add to your faith virtue. Get some moral goodness in your life. And you say, well, what's virtue? Well, look at Philippians 4, 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be, only, be any praise, think on these things. So things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report are virtuous things. Make sure the things you think about and do are those things. Add to your faith virtue, and it will make you grow up. It says, into knowledge, temperance, into temperance, patience, into patience, godliness, into godliness, brotherly kindness, into brotherly kindness, charity. So add patience, add brotherly kindness, add some charity to your faith. Those things are greatly lacking among Bible believers, don't you think? They think they know all about God because they know a lot of the Bible, and yet they don't know how to be kind to their brother in Christ. It says in Second Peter 1 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If those things abound in you, then you'll continuously grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of people are ever learning but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But if you have heard the truth and you've believed the truth and knowing you have the truth, that's the greatest weapon in your lap and should encourage you to fill your mind with the wisdom and knowledge that's contained in those pages. When you realize that it is the truth and you believe it, it should make you be eager to open it. It says in... Verse 19 and 20, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. You see, you can't just take the book and say, well, that's my interpretation, or everybody just interprets it different. How many times you heard somebody say that? Well, everybody interprets it differently, and all that kind of stuff. 
I hate when people say that because I hate to be a uh, such a uh, bubble buster, but that's a bunch of craziness. You can't just come up with your own ter- interpretation. Just because you see something in the Bible a certain way doesn't mean you're seeing it right. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. Does is your interpretation is it lining up with the context, and are are you does it completely contradict something else in the Bible that's very plain? Now, you can't just say, well, we all got our own interpretation. The prophecy of the Scripture is of is not of any private interpretation. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You have knowledge from God and about God right there in your lap. I mean, it's everywhere you go, if you think about it, if you live in America, or at least where I live, in the southern states. Uh, the Bible Belt. I mean, you go to Walmart; they got a a Bible stand. In my town, they do. There's like a just a little pallet there in the middle of the floor with all kinds of Bibles on it. You go to the Dollar Tree; there's dollar Bibles. You get a smartphone; tons of Bible apps. You go to the doctor; Bible in there. You go to the hotel; open the door drawer. There's a Bible in there. You know, everywhere you look, there's a Bible. There's no excuse not to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, you have knowledge from God and about God in your lap. And God loves to use men to do what He wants to be done. And He found some holy men and gave them His words. They spake the words as the Holy Ghost moved moved them. And now He's giving those words to you. And you have an advantage that they didn't have because it's you got it all, and it's all already wrote down for you, and you have the complete 66 books. You have more light of the scriptures than they had. You got more light of the scriptures than Elijah had. Uh, you don't have any excuse not to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And we can look back and see the Savior in the prophecies and the types, and we can see His death, burial, and resurrection. They couldn't see all that. They didn't have as much light as you got. But if you're going to be able to combat these false teachers, you're going to have to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 2, it talks about these covetous false teachers. It talks about the angels that sinned. It talks about these wicked things. And you know why you need to get more knowledge? Because there's men out there that can trick you. It says in Second Peter 2, 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. You see, they bring in damnable heresies, teachings that lead men straight to hell. And you see, even many Christians get deceived by it. They can't go to hell if they're born again, but they can be deceived by it and in turn deceive others with this false teaching. You see, like the Galatians got deceived. You see, because they just don't know enough to know that these people in front of them are false teachers. And it says in verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, through covetousness, shall they with feigned words Make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Feigned words, that is fake, pretend words. They just want to make merchandise of people. They get up and say a bunch of stuff that's that's not real, it's all fake. And that means they just they just want to get rich off of you and make merchandise off of you and play you like a sucker. They have pernicious ways, that means destructive I looked at that just to get the definition of it up. It says destructive, having the quality of killing, destroying, or injuring. You see, there are men in this world that don't care who they hurt on their way to getting rich. You see, the this uh, filthy rapper named 50 Cent came out with a CD when I was a little kid called Get Rich or Die Trying. Sadly, that could be a slogan for a lot of these pansy-like Money-hungry pastors. That could be their ministry slogan. Get rich or die trying. That's all they care about. 
They're more about money than Puff Daddy, that rapper. All these rappers, it's all about money. When I was a kid, he had a wicked song called All About the Benjamins. You know, the uh, Benjamin on, on the $100 bill. And that's the mindset of preachers. That's what they're all about. They're not all about the Bible. They're not all about the King James Bible. They're all about money. That's the mindset of Kenneth Copeland. I've heard rappers even praise the televangelist Creflo Dollar. That guy is a fake, and he's full of it. He's a liar, and he has no business even having a congregation and preaching to him. He's just trying to get their money. All he wants to do is make merchandise of people. T.D. Jakes is a lying faker. Beth Moore, Paula White, Joyce Meyer, and these female pastors, it's all deception. They don't believe the Bible. They're so money hungry that they will trample over 1 Timothy 2.12 that says, For I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. They trample over that to do what they're doing. They don't believe the Bible. And I mostly blame the men for allowing the female pastors to even exist. You see, every man's doing what's right in their own eyes. They don't care about the Bible. The men need to learn the Bible so much that they're light years ahead of any woman. Your wife should not know more Bible than you know. That makes no sense. You see, the husband and wife relationship pictures Christ and the church, Christ and his bride. When the wife knows more Bible than her husband, that's messing with the picture because the bride doesn't know more than Christ does. How do you feel having a woman leading you spiritually? If you are one of these people with a woman pastor, how do you feel having a woman as your spiritual leader? Unless you're just a freshly born-again, wet-behind-the-ears new convert, you shouldn't have some woman in your life. I mean, you shouldn't have her for a pastor, period, ever, because that's completely against the Bible. But, you know, you should be the one that knows more Bible than her, not the other way around. The Christian men today are so sorry. They have no appetite for the Word of God. They don't read it. They don't study it. They don't take notes on anything. All they care about is sports and hunting and golfing and work and hanging out with their boys. And they just want to hang out with the boys all the time. And they hang out with the boys so much that they could just write a, a bromance novel about hanging out with the boys so much. They hang out with the boys more than they hang out with their wife. I always thought it was weird that a guy wants to go hang out with a bunch of other sweaty guys more than he does his wife. That's just weird. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there's those angels, those angels that sinned. And those angels can deceive as well. You know, it talks about in uh, Corinthians... How the woman needs to have power on her head because of the angels. And if you compare this verse with Jude, verse 6, it says, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. You see, these angels that knew what it was like in the presence of God rebelled, and now they are in everlasting chains under darkness. And some of the angels obviously rebelled with Lucifer, and some of the angels, which are sons of God, came down in Genesis 6, and they died like men in the flood, as it talks about in Psalm 82, where he told them they're going to die like men and fall like one of the princes. But it says in Second Peter 2, 5, and, uh, 2, 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. I heard this LGBT woman pastor saying that Sodom and Gomorrah was a queer positive. She said queer positive story. She was crazy. She was missing something in her brain. 
You see, uh, she had on a priest outfit, and she came out and said that this was her priestly drag. She was dressed up like a priest, and she said this was her priestly drag. And she had a Bible in her hand, waving it around to hundreds of people in the crowd. But she never opened the Bible one time, and she said that Sodom and Gomorrah is a queer, positive story. That's crazy. Sodom and Gomorrah, the story about Sodom and Gomorrah is not a queer positive story at all. They got burned to death with fire and brimstone because the Lord saw that their wickedness was great. It says in Genesis thirteen thirteen, 13, it, it, it talks about them and it calls them wicked sinners. It says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. They should be an example to not be sodomites or lesbians it's not a good thing at all to be that i don't see where she gets that's a queer positive story second peter 2 7 and delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked see their conversation not just the way they talked but the way they walked the way that their manner of life was was filthy and a man who will kiss another man in the mouth obviously doesn't care what goes in or comes out of his mouth. If you will allow another man's tongue in your mouth, that's nasty. He ain't no telling what you'll do and say if you'll do that. If a man, you see, if a man will dress up like a woman and not just like a regular woman, like some type of stripper or hooker, walking around the streets of New York at midnight, if we would dress up like that, and then walk around in front of young children, then he obviously has no limits on how he will live his life. These are devil-possessed people. And if your heart is right with God, it will vex you. It's going to bother you. It ought to bother you when you hear about these drag queen story hours. When you hear about these drag queens parading their nasty flesh in front of little kids. You know what vex means? Here's some definitions. To irritate, to make angry, uh, to plague, to torment, to harass, to afflict, to disturb, to disquiet, to trouble, to distress. You ought to be very deeply disturbed and bothered by a man that dresses up like another man, and especially if he wants to do that in front of little kids, especially your kid. And if you would take your kids to see that, you got problems, very bad problems. When I see a grown man dressed up like a woman and reading to a bunch of first graders, it makes me filled with just anger, sadness. I'm disturbed, I'm troubled, and distressed. And if those aren't emotions that you have when you see that, there's a big problem with you. You ought to be vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And that's exactly, that is the most vile, wicked stuff when you mix, try to mix little kids in with your sin. You see, you know the devils like to come after people when they are of a child. They want to get them while they're young. You know, Jesus asked, you know, the man how long the devils had been with that boy, and he said, since he was of a child. Second Peter 2 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them, talking about Lot, dwelling among Sodom, the Sodomites, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In seeing in seeing and hearing Having to go to the grocery store and see a boy dressed up like a woman is vexing. It's not right that my kid has to see such perversion. That's a vexing thing. You can't go to the grocery store. You can't go out to eat. You can't go get you a Happy Meal. I went and got a Happy Meal. And on the Happy Meal, it had two, two husbands holding hands and they had a child. That's vexing. That ought to bother you. And if that don't bother you, what is wrong with you? If you can go to these places where there's a woman pastor and she's pro-LGBT and pro-abortion, 
and gets up in her priestly drag, as she calls it, what is wrong with you? You are past having any feeling about anything. And what's the point? What's the? It would be better off to not even go to church if that's your only option. If that's all you got, you might as well just stay at the house. Chapter 3. It talks about one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. That's the thing that really stuck out to me in this chapter. That verse just blows my mind. Second Peter 3, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. If eternity is like that, think about it. If when you step into eternity, and I'm just speculating here, that if when we step into eternity, if we start seeing time, how God's seeing it, and one day, and I know there's no time in eternity, but since we can't understand in our minds eternity, I'm talking in concept of time. If you if you um if you start seeing it like that, then think about it. Peter and Paul probably feel like they've only been gone for like two days. Because I mean, they were about they were here about two thousand years ago, right? So that's about two days the way God sees it. If a thousand years is as one day. You know, and we're at the tipping off point, right? You most likely believe that, that the rapture could happen any moment. It's most likely going to happen soon. So me and you are at the tipping off point. The rapture is most likely going to happen very soon. So if you died right now, imagine that you died right now, right when I said this. When you get to the third heaven, it will probably seem like a few seconds and then boom, the rapture is going to happen. Because since there's not much time left until the rapture happens... And one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. If we see time that way when we get into eternity, it, when, as soon as you get there, it's going to seem like, okay, I open my eyes in, in heaven and eternity. Boom, the rapture is happening. So it's like you're not even going to go that long without seeing your loved ones. If it's that way, and I'm just speculating. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to die in their sins and go to hell. That's why He's so long-suffering with people. And if God chose who was saved and who was damned, the verse would make no sense. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to be saved. He says in Second Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. You see, the day of the Lord can be more than one day in our time, because, remember, as the verse just said above this, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and as a thousand years is one day. And you'll find that the day of the Lord can cover, when the Bible talks about the day of the Lord, you'll find it, in the context of the tribulation, even up until the end of the millennium. And that is when he blows everything to bits. After the millennium, you know, Satan gets loose for a little season. Fire comes down out of heaven, devours him and his army that he's gathered. That's like the sand of the sea. And then the Lord just blows everything to bits. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And you see, the, they, they talk, scientists talk about the Big Bang, but the Big Bang didn't happen at the beginning, it's happened at the ending. And then God's going to change his clothes. He, he, you see, he, he's, he's, clothed, he's clothed with the universe. He's going to change his clothes and put on a new heaven and a new earth. It says in Second Peter 3.18, Once again, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So you need to get some knowledge about your Savior. You need to get some knowledge about His salvation. You need to get some knowledge about His plan and prophecy. You know, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.